Ikke mere med det. This is fucking important to me. And this is going to start the program. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right, you bastards. You're having it. Oh, Christ. Tell me when. My name is Bert Spencer. I don't run and I don't hide. And I do tend to say it as it is, regardless. Many of you will remember my name in relation to the murder of Carl Bridgewater. I did not kill Carl Bridgewater. And I am here to prove to you that I did not. On the 19th of September 1978, 13-year-old Carl Bridgewater left his home in Wordsley, the West Midlands. Like thousands of other children across the country, he was carrying out a paper round for pocket money. He's a reliable lad, you know, you, you could always rely on him to do things, you know. So, never had no worries about him doing his paper round. At 4 p.m., Carl was making one of his final deliveries of the day to Yew Tree Farm. The owners, an elderly couple, were out. It seems Carl entered the farmhouse and disturbed a burglary. Carl was then shot in the face with a shotgun at point blank range. The cold blooded murder of a young boy sparked the biggest police manhunt for a child killer since the Moors murders. We have a good witness and a very clear and uh, lucid type of witness. And he had a very good close look at a man sitting behind the wheel of a, what is probably a blue estate car. There's a distinct possibility that this is one of the men that we are looking for. The police's suspicions were quickly aroused by a local ambulance officer, Bert Spencer. They told me that the paper boy, Carl, has been shot. And I just sat there and I thought, oh my God. And my dad was number one suspect. The one who pulled the trigger, you know, I wish I could get my hands on him, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's very hard to describe that, you know, your feelings to that person. Since Carl's murder nearly 40 years ago, Bert Spencer has lived under the constant shadow of suspicion. Now, he has decided it's time to speak out. The murder of 13-year-old Carl Bridgewater, even by the grisly standards of murder itself, at Utree Farm in Staffordshire on the afternoon of September 19th, 1978, was appalling. On his after-school newspaper round, he unknowingly disturbed an antiques burglary at this lonely farmhouse and was brutally shot down. It was evening meal time, like, you know, and uh, we usually sat down to our evening meal all together and uh, Carl hadn't returned and Janet got a bit worried, you see, so uh, I went to look for him. When I got down by U Tree Farm, there was a police car there, you see, so I pulled up and... Uh, Asked him if he'd seen a paper boy at all, you know. And that's when he said that there had been an incident with a boy, you know, and I had to wait. West Midlands police reconstructed Carl's last known movements in a bid to jog the public's memory. I am quite sure that the offenders went to the farmhouse to break in and steal antiques and as I say, I'm looking for a link in other similar offences. As police began to gather witness statements, there was one in particular that stood out. Local company director Roger Edwards 
gave a very specific account of a vehicle and its driver. I saw a pale blue saloon car, a Vauxhall Viva, turning into Yew Tree Farm. I noticed the driver was a man. He was wearing a dark blue uniform. Police searched for records for all owners of such vehicles in a 50 mile radius. One of the owners was ambulance officer Bert Spencer. When police realized that he wore a uniform to work and was a part-time antique stealer, Bert became a focus of their inquiries. This is what Bert Spencer told police officers during an interview at his home just five days after the murder of Carl. I'm a married man residing with my wife and family at the above address. I'm very interested in antiques, mainly clocks, and occasionally purchase things for my collection. I'm not a dealer. I'm employed by the West Midlands Health Authority. On Tuesday 19th of September, I was on duty at the hospital from approximately half past eight until approximately 10 past five. I'm the registered owner of a Vauxhall Viva saloon motor car. In that first interview, there were some pieces of information which Bert chose not to volunteer to police. He did not tell them that he knew the Bridgewater family and that in fact, he had been close neighbours of theirs in Wordsley for a number of years. Nor did he tell them that he regularly hunted with a shotgun on land surrounding Yew Tree Farm, where the murder was committed. Criminologist Professor David Wilson is used by police forces across the country to get inside the minds of murderers. Uh, my name's Simon Golding. I'm a journalist and writer and have been working on a book, a biography of sorts. The man called Bert Spencer. I was wondering if you would be interested in possibly interviewing Bert. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you for your time and look forward to hearing from you. The murder of Carl Bridgewater is one of the most infamous unsolved murders in British criminal history. And if Bert Spencer has agreed to be interviewed, that's too good an opportunity to miss. After an initial approach through his biographer, Bert Spencer has invited Professor Wilson to meet him at his home in a remote part of Lincolnshire so they can discuss the murder of Carl Bridgewater. He's giving me a wave. Oh, that's very kind of him. Ah, I think Bert's coming out to meet me as well. Well, I've read so much about you, it's a pleasure to meet you. I am. It's Hello, very nice to meet you. Come on. How are you? Oh, all right, mate. I'm so pleased to meet you. Well, it's lovely to meet you. Thank you for I've asking us. i a lot about us. you. Some of it was good. <laughs> <laughs> You're more than welcome to come into our home. Come on. Oh, thank you. And come on. Hello. Hello. I'm Christine. Christine, hello. My name is David Wilson. It's very um, nice to meet you. I've heard quite a lot about you. Oh, well, I hope some of it was good as he some promised. Some of it was. <laughs> yeah. Some of it. Come on in. <laughs> Come on in. Just go on in and, and relax. All oh, right. Yours? Yes. Uh, some of them are in here. And always animals? Do you always paint no, no, animals? No, no, no. Look, look behind you. There's all there's there's oh, scenes, is this one of yours landscape too? scene. Some got burned when my former wife uh, had a funny and threw me out, and she burned a lot in the garden. Lots of things she burned. But these are some of them, yes. Yeah. She burnt your paintings? Burnt a lot of stuff. Why uh, did she do that? Well, she went a little bit uh, unwell. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And she used to do that now and again, and um, that's in one of those episodes. Yeah, I lost a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I was at work at the time. Also, you're an you're a ambulance officer. Oh, that's from a long time ago, yeah. I did uh, 19 years with them. Uh-huh. A problem is... Anything good you've done in life, like saving lives, delivering babies, that was lovely. Mm. Helping deliver babies, that was beautiful. It doesn't count for anything when you get yourself into trouble. 
Yeah. It's all demolished. Yeah. And it's a shame, really, because uh, it's still in my mind, it's still in my heart. I'm still in my heart, an ambulance man. Uh-huh. Although physically I can't be now. Yeah. Well, oh, what about a cup of tea then? Maybe start formally having a chat. You want a things. cup of tea? That's 30 pence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I've got it. I'm sure I've got the 30p. Come with me, come with me, Dad. Thank you. Now then, throughout this day... What was it that appealed to you about ambulance driving? That's been a recurring theme. I know, I don't know. We used to go out in the middle of the night helping babies. We used to stop in the snow and, uh, and Mum would have a baby. So I took a course to make sure I'd never do anything wrong. The baby would survive my rough handling, as it were. All these little things, soaking wet, covered in blood, and this little tiny thing, uh, I've got life. And I don't know what it is. I'm getting emotional. I know you are. You... Can we just wait a bit? Yes, yes, of course. <sighs> you tell me when you feel ready to start. We're going through stuff, emotional stuff. Let's talk about the death of Carl Bridgewater. Yes. Where were you when you first heard the news that Carl Bridgewater had been murdered? At home. No, sorry, sorry. I was at work the next day. How did you react? Bloody hell, <laughs> you know. When you were first interviewed... Yes. ...by the police, here was this shocking murder... Yeah of a paper boy, you knew the farm. Yes. You knew the family, the yes. Bridgewaters. But you didn't really offer very much to the police in that first interview. I knew them. They weren't personal friends. I know you. You're not personal friend. So if you got stabbed tomorrow in Boston, I haven't got much to offer. I knew you, yes. There's a witness who says, that he saw a Vauxhall Viva, right. which you had at the time, right. and the person driving the Vauxhall Viva yeah. was wearing a uniform with two pips right. on it. Thank you for saying that. If you ever went down to U Tree Farm, down the lane, and saw a Vauxhall Viva turning left, you'd see a back of a Vauxhall TV turning left. You'd see nothing else whatsoever. You've just mentioned a car that could have been mine. It wasn't. Because of the sighting of a uniformed man in a blue Vauxhall, the police decided to question Bert again, this time at Corbett Hospital where he worked. They were particularly interested in his alibi, which his secretary, Barbara, provided. I can confirm that Mr. Hubert Spencer was at Corbett Hospital all afternoon. What Bert did not tell police was that Barbara and he were close friends and neighbours. Someone said he didn't tell the police that Barbara Reibold lived ten doors up the same road. She was the secretary you She was the secretary at the hospital. At the hospital. They didn't ask. Mm. You know, I could have said I've got green socks on tonight. I've just had a poo in the toilet. They didn't ask. Mm. And I appreciated what they were there for. They were asking questions. And I answered the questions. I answered every question. You continue to campaign against people thinking that you had anything to do with that crime. I've stopped that now. Listen, I'm on camera. I don't give a shit. Think what you will. Well, I think I was, you know, in shock for quite a while. I, I just... Well, I, I just wouldn't believe them that it had... No, I, you know, I just thought they was making it up, that I just couldn't believe that it had happened. In the weeks following the murder of newspaper boy Carl Bridgewater, a local ambulance man, Bert Spencer, was the police's prime suspect. Things were going and dropping into place, which 
I'd say as a, not as an ordinary, as a policeman or a detective, but I would have said, mm, blue car, Bert's got a blue car. Person in uniform, Bert wears a uniform. Knows the family, Bert knows the family. He knew where they lived. Well, three out of three makes a story. Despite the growing body of circumstantial evidence pointing to Bert, just 10 weeks after Carl's murder, the police suddenly had a new lead and a new set of suspects. A professional gang had used a shotgun in another farmhouse raid, just 10 miles from Utree Farm. The police picked up four men, all known to them as armed robbers. Michael Hickey, Vincent, his cousin, James Robinson. A fourth, Pat Malloy. After several days of interrogation, one of the men, Patrick Malloy, admitted to being at Utree Farm. He said he was upstairs when he heard a gunshot and that his accomplice, 16-year-old Michael Hickey, had accidentally killed Carl with a shotgun. Malloy's confession led the rest of the gang to turn on one another. Despite the absence of any physical evidence against them, these confessions led to their successful prosecution and the so-called Bridgewater Four were jailed for between 12 and 25 years. But there was one person who was convinced that the Bridgewater Four were innocent and they'd been set up by the police. Then, as the teenager Michael Hickey was led away, his mother, Anne, rushed to the front of the gallery and cried down to him tearfully, I'll fight, Michael, I'll fight. At the time, no one paid much attention to Anne Whelan's campaign. As far as the public was concerned, Carl's killers were safely behind bars. But then, exactly one month after the Bridgewater trial, there was another brutal shotgun murder in the sleepy rural community of Stourbridge. Here at Holloway House Farm, a half mile from Utre, again another brutal shotgun killing. This time the victim was a 70-year-old farmer called Hubert Wilkes. It wasn't just the uncanny similarity of the shootings or their proximity that made headlines. It was the name of the person who immediately confessed to the killing. That person was Bert Spencer. In the middle of a late night social gathering, Wilkes' close friend, Hubert Spencer, left the room, returned with a shotgun and killed him. Bert has never talked in detail about the one murder he does admit to, the shooting of his own friend, farmer Hubert Wilkes. This little old man, I love him because he was like a father. On December the 13th, 1979, Farmer Wilkes hosted a gathering for Bert's 40th birthday at Holloway House Farm. Wilkes's daughter, Jean, Bert, and his first wife, Janet, were the guests. Hubert Wilkes used to brag. The farmers used to get together and he'd mix special cocktails to get the women pissed and they'd have a swap around. Thought nothing of it. But I must have thought something of it. I'd had a lot of whiskey before I went there, because it was my birthday. I'd had a lot of whiskey. I used to drink whiskey, I don't know, because in case it makes me nasty. Poured the drinks. Then he stood up, and he says, in a great big loud voice, Janet! Janet. I've made you a special cocktail. And I cannot remember what happened next. Apparently, I took his gun from the door jam, went to my car, got a hacksaw, I cut the barrel off. I went in. And then I went and shot him. Bert also viciously attacked his wife, Janet who managed to escape from the farm, still bleeding in a state of shock. 
Janet's daughter remembers exactly what her mother said the night her father murdered Hubert Wilkes. She has asked not to be filmed. My mother said she got up from the settee and they had a fight. As she was trying to grab the gun off him, he used the butt of the gun and, and just constantly hit her on the top of her head. And she ran off and she ran into the kitchen and my dad was chasing her through the house and she hid under the table. I picked another gun up from another door jam, put it in my car. I drove up the lane and saw an ambulance. Oh, my mates. And I stopped. I stopped. It's all insane. <laughs> and a, a driver came up and he said, Bert, <coughs> don't go down the lane. There's a gunman on the loose. I said, Barry, I think it's me. Bert's confession and refusal to offer any defence or explanation to the jury meant his trial lasted just four days. He was sentenced to life for murder. Bert's conviction and the many similarities between the murder of Carl and Wilkes were further ammunition to those convinced the Bridgewater Four were innocent. This is one of the fields that used to be belonging to the farm. Ah. Today, nearly 40 years after the night he murdered farmer Wilkes, Bert Spencer is returning with the criminologist David Wilson to Holloway House Farm, the scene of his crime. And farmer Wilkes farmed Yew Tree Farm and, as well. And there's a farm, that's Holloway House Farm there. Oh my gosh, it looks pretty impressive, doesn't it? That is how it was. And um, I was his gardener, his chauffeur. What would you say to Hubert Wilkes? No, I'm so ashamed, no, I'll say nothing. Nothing? No. Mm -hmm. This hurts. Oh, cos I, I, I shot him, didn't I? Friend. It hurts. It hurts me. I, I don't expect you to understand that. It does. No, I understand it. I understand that it's very emotional and overpowering. I just went bloody mad, didn't I, for a few minutes? How come Hubert Wilkes ends up dead in exactly the same way as Carl Bridgewater? I don't know about that. I don't know circumstances or what, what do you call it, um, coincidence or whatever, but apparently he did. Yeah. Th that must strike you. That coincidence must eerie. strike you as eerie, eerie. and odd. Yes, yes. They said to me, the police said, it's exactly the same as Carl died, exactly the same. Those eerie similarities were to haunt Bert Spencer for his entire time in prison. And they also fueled the campaign to free the Bridgewater Four, who in 1981 launched the first of several appeals against their convictions for Carl's murder, claiming Bert Spencer was the real killer. There are a number of coincidences which, if there hadn't been that second murder at the farm up the road, one may never have known about. Shouting Bert's name from the rooftops, one of the Bridgewater four men started the longest prison protest in history, 89 days. Michael Hickey demonstrated on the roof of Leicestershire's top security, Gartree Prison, stating his case through a makeshift loud hailer. Hickey also painted the name of the man he believed was the real killer on the roof for all to see, Spencer. The investigative journalist Paul Foote was persuaded to join the Bridgewater campaign. And with his help, Bert's name was rarely out of the headlines. These alleged, what did I call them, celebrities, the campaign group is full of celebrities all trying to get me hung for the crime. They didn't know what they were talking about, but they, some, some of those groups, came to Wilmot Scrubs, 11.30 one night, and outside the big wall with the razor on it, chanting, chanting to the, to the kill Bert Spencer, kill Bert Spencer, Carl Bridgewater, blah, blah, inciting the inmates to kill me. And you, members of that campaign group, 
judge me. I won't name you here. I won't name and shame you here. I may do one day. I may. Well, wow. thank you very much, Bert, for agreeing to see me, and I'll see you again soon, I hope. More than welcome, any time. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you again. Safe journey. Thank yeah. you. Come on, here. I'm developing a picture of Bert. I don't want to easily jump to labels, but there was some huge narcissism. And think about how he could switch on and off emotion. We need to check the materials in relation to his movements on the day that Carl Bridgewater died. Come on, babe. Right. And Bert, Bert's just coming behind us with a, another dog. So, do you know whose dog it is, Bert? We're going to find out up there. All right, love. Come on, babe. In there, love. In there. That's what's going through his mind at the minute. He wants to know exactly what I think. He wants to know if he passed the test. There he goes. The hero in his own mind. Animal lover child lover, killer. I had no involvement in the Carl Bridgewater murder. I did not kill Carl. No involvement whatsoever. And this lie has been going on for 18 years. Bert Spencer was released from prison in 1995. He served 14 years without parole for refusing to show any remorse or shed any light on why he had murdered Hubert Wilkes. Less than two years later, the Bridgewater Four would also find themselves free men. Cries of joy, cheers of jubilation, and first embraces with those who'd helped them find freedom. The Bridgewater Four's convictions were quashed because lawyers were able to prove that the original confession, which was also the key piece of evidence against them, had been forged. The defence lawyers also repeatedly named an alternative suspect, Bert Spencer. Mr Bennett Heitner, QC, spoke about a man seen by police after the murder called Herbert Spencer. Mr Spencer had also failed to disclose that he knew Carl Bridgewater, that he bought and sold antiques, and that he had permission to shoot birds at Utree Farm. With Carl Bridgewater's killer still at large, Bert Spencer once again found himself being asked difficult questions about the newspaper boy's death. Or well, joining me now are Bert Spencer, who's been accused of killing Carl Bridgewater, his wife Christina, and Anne Whelan, Michael Hickey's mother. Do you now feel the need to get involved in the search to find that man? I won't rest, let's put it like this, until the perpetrator of that child, the killing of that child, is behind bars. I mean, he has been accused of this um, by prisoners seven times, at least. Now, after reading that this morning, a lot of people are going to draw the conclusion yeah. that you killed Carl Bridgewater. A lot of people are, but nothing keeps the spotlight off me while there's people like Anne Whelan pointing her finger at me. I do not fear any police investigation. I would welcome one. It wasn't me that accused you in the very first place. I want to finish, please. You were. Um, is this not a fact you did have guns? Is this not a fact you were an antique dealer? Is this not a fact you live next door to the child and you refuse to tell the police that? Is this not a fact that your car was seen turning into Yew Tree Farm, that the, the police went out in, in a 50-mile radius to look for Vauxhall Vivas? They came up with a few Vauxhall you Vivas. Don't like is this a fact that you were the only man in uniform that was found and it you happened to be like the man. Answers. Is this a fact when they went to your house, you could have said, go and see my colleague, Mrs Rybold, she will give you an alibi. Is I this did not so. a fact your papers have gone missing? Don't lie on this programme. She went to the hospital. Mr I Spencer, so. I have this in... I don't need papers. I don't think there's anything I in have... your head of worth... worth uh, well, I'm moment. sorry. This now, has this, to be sorted this is, out This properly. is not a court. All right, Neither right. is it trial by media. All right, but let me ask you one question. For the record... Right, ask it. Did you shoot Carl Bridgewater? I did not. And that is on the record. And no attempts by these people, no amount of attempts, is going to remove it from the record. Talking about facts, that lady is fact. During the course of the campaign to free the Bridgewater Four, Anne Whelan accumulated thousands of legal documents. 
which she believes may still help catch Carl Bridgewater's killer. David Wilson has been given unrestricted access to the materials. And there are all these boxes related to the case? Yes, cabinets and all those boxes and the boxes all behind and everything. It's crystal clear in some of these boxes that you see that the evidence is there to convict the person that um, is responsible for the horrific murder. You know, psychopath, I think, he is. So that's what I'm hoping anyway. And you've been incredibly vocal about saying that Bert Spencer was responsible for Carl's murder. Why do you think he's never sued you? Well, because he did it. Because he's guilty. If he sued me, he takes me into a court of law, doesn't he? The quashing of those convictions inevitably put the spotlight back onto Bert Spencer. You met him a few times. How did those encounters go? I find him personally, um, again, a personal uh, feeling this is, quite a chilling man. How does Bert Spencer react to you on a personal level? Oh, most of the time, wishes me dead. That's the best thing that could happen to me. So, uh, and I'll tell you why, I think, because he knows that I'm right. I've got a feeling he wants to be challenged. He knows he's guilty. I think he's playing a game with everybody. I know, I just know. I'm not just pointing a finger because of the sake of it. But in my eyes, Bert Spencer killed Carl Bridgewater. I don't want to speak to Anne Whelan. I have no interest whatsoever in my life. She's not in part of my life. She's a nothing. I actually hate the bitch. I worship the ground she's got coming to her. Horrible bitch. Her boy did it. I am absolutely convinced. Professor David Wilson recruited a team of researchers at Birmingham City University to sift through the Bridgewater archive, which Anne Whelan had kept in her shed. This is old-fashioned research. In these boxes are documents collected over the course of 20 years by Anne Whelan, who is the mother of Michael Hickey, one of the Bridgewater Four. Frankly, they're a treasure trove of information. And I believe that in these boxes is the identity of the killer of Carl Bridgewater. Searching through the papers, the researchers uncover documents that David believes may be of real importance. All ambulance officers kept timesheets. These would have proven Bert's whereabouts and supported his alibi. But crucial records and logbooks on the critical days had vanished. A police officer has gone and looked at the ambulance's daily record sheets, and unfortunately, on the date of Carl's murder, the record sheets are missing. Bert claims it was corrupt policemen who removed the records to make him look guilty at the time when they thought he was the prime suspect. As the search continues, there's another revealing discovery. The complete transcript of the second interview conducted with Bert at Corbett Hospital. The police officer says, I made known to him the reason for my visit and said, have you visited Yew Tree Farm? Spencer replied, yes, I have. You found out. When asked if he'd ever been to Yew Tree Farm in uniform, Bert replied, I think so. In his first police interview, Bert Spencer failed to disclose that he knew the Bridgewaters and had been their neighbor for several years. This time, he admitted he did know Carl Bridgewater. He said, well, you know, I used to live in the same area. The officer said, three doors away. You were 21 and he was 25. He would know you, I suppose. 
Well, perhaps I didn't recognize him, replied Bert. That's a very odd statement, isn't it? Yeah. I didn't recognize him. Is he meaning the press photographs? Or is he meaning actually in Yew Tree Farm that day? Does Carl Bridgewater have to die for the simple instrumental reason that Bert didn't recognize him, but Carl recognized Bert? Since killing Hubert Wilkes nearly four decades ago, Bert Spencer has lived with the label of murderer. We make mistakes. Some of us make dreadful mistakes. I took a life, OK? I, I, I'm fully aware of the, the awfulness of that. The wind's blowed that off, look. I go to church and I say, with you, the Lord's Prayer, forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. What a load of liars we are as a nation. We will not forgive those who trespass against us. We want revenge. Why didn't you forgive me? You're liars, you're two-faced, as you talk to your God. And he will do something about it one day. After sifting through the original police investigation into Bert Spencer, David wants to ask Bert directly about the mysterious missing ambulance timesheets and his alibi. Those records, by going missing, were unable to corroborate what it was that you said about where you were, because your, your argument is that you were at Corbett yes, Hospital okay. all day. What was it in the book? What was in the book might have been something that could exonerate you completely. Yes, yes. Something in the book might have been something that would incriminate you completely. Yes, yes. So the book going missing is quite important in terms of the story we've been discussing. It is. But if there was something in that book that could incriminate me, why didn't they give it to the news media? We've got him. Because it was you that took it. That's oh, their argument. <laughs> their argument is it was you that took the book. You couldn't get in. You can't get in. But you knew that headquarters really well, didn't you? I knew you? it very, really well. You definitely were at Corbett Hospital all day. All day. All day, didn't every, you? Every minute of that day, and it was proven, so... But... Well, well, it hasn't been proven, because the thing that could prove that, Bert, were the records, and the records went missing. I'm worried that you're getting cold. I am cold, yes. So let's go back to the house. I am cold. Who is Bert Spencer? Bert Spencer is, I am my daddy's boy. He was a nasty hard bastard. Are you a nasty That's hard? Me. Are you a nasty hard bastard? No, but I'm his boy and I. So I'm the apple never falls too far from the tree? Is that what you're arguing? Possibly, I don't know. If you jump on my back, you'll get hurt. Okay, if you don't jump on my back, I'll love you and cuddle you and treat you out. Don't attack me, because I am my daddy's boy. And it'll come out. It's know, not anger, you know, is it? No, it feels like a threat. Yeah, oh, shut up. It does. <laughs> it does. It feels like a threat. But no, no. I have to reflect. You asked me a question. I'm trying to answer it. Oh, yeah. Who, who am I? You answered it very clearly. I did. You did. I meant you, to. I understood what you were it's arguing. It's not threatening you. Mm. It's not threatening... It's not threatening anyone. If anyone jumps on my back with uh, aggression in mind, I can deal with it like my dad did. I am my daddy's boy. But if we cross you, Bert... You've done it. You've crossed that barrier. Mm -hmm. I won't hurt you. Mm -hmm. I'll discuss with you. I'll question. I'll question you. I'll question anybody. What does it mean to be labelled as a murderer? Just stop a minute. Mm -hmm. If you could switch off time and go back in time to 1978. Yeah, 1978. 
What would you have changed in your life at that point? I'd have been away on holiday, away from the West Midlands. The bad memories in 78? If, if you want to stop, you can stop. Just stop. You know, fair credit to him. I keep trying to explain to him that people will look at this, and he calls it trial by media. Well, actually, it's him that's called. It's him that's, it's him that's set himself up as a court. He's put himself in the dock. As a criminal psychologist, David Wilson is trained to evaluate offenders showing symptoms of psychopathy. This is known as a P-scan. It's not a clinical diagnosis, but a recognised method for evaluating the criminal mind, widely used by law enforcement. What I'll do tonight is I'm going to do a, a P-scan on him, which is simply looking to see if, based on the things that he's written, the performances in terms of TV, my own knowledge now of him through some 20 hours of interview, am I dealing with somebody who's psychopathic? I haven't slept for two nights thinking about it. He told me to delve on this and delve on that. I'm not happy with him. It's all to do with multiple psychotic killers. Is he trying to make me one? Is he trying to tie me into Carl Bridgewater? And it feels as though he is. I wasn't there. I wasn't guilty. And now he's raising it all up again. That criminalises me. I could be bloody arrested. I'm a lifer. He's got me on trial by media. I want to ask him face to face, what do you hope to achieve from this broadcast? The sound of a shotgun being discharged in an enclosed area like this is absolutely ear-shattering. The 13-year-old newsboy from Wordsley, Starbridge, Carl Bridgewater, never heard the shot that killed him. He died instantly as he was blasted at point-blank range in the head. Professor David Wilson has now spent more than 20 hours talking to Bert Spencer and believes he may be displaying some of the classic symptoms of psychopathy. For further insight, David decided to contact Bert's daughter, who is still on good terms with him. She was a friend of Carl's and played with him on the street where they both lived, and she believes her father is innocent of murder. But even she thinks there's more to the story than Bert will admit. I was in school, and then they told me that the paper boy, Carl, has been shot. And I just sat there and I thought, oh my God. And my dad was number one suspect. I've always felt that he saw something that day that killed him inside. Bert's daughter has a theory that while her father did not kill Carl, he may have inadvertently stumbled across a crime scene at Yew Tree Farm. <laughs> Suddenly, you hear a gunshot go off. And then, after it's all dispersed, you go in and you see something. And you can't believe what you're looking at and what you're witnessing and what you're seeing. And you're just horrified. I have tried to discuss that with him on, on, on an occasion, but he was very emotional. That's remarkable. She herself says, that she thinks her father was at Yew Tree Farm on the day that Carl Bridgewater was murdered. She herself believes that her father, with whom she retains a wonderful relationship, hasn't revealed the full truth, that there's something more going on, and she thinks, at the very least, what more was going on was he was at the farm on the day that Carl was murdered. Now, isn't that a powerful piece of testimony? Because this is not somebody who's attacking Bert. This isn't Paul Foote. This isn't the Bridgewater 4 campaign. This is his own 
daughter. Hello again, David. Yeah, how are you? Thanks for coming all this way. Ah, good to see you again. And you're wearing a tie. I know. Do you want to borrow it? <laughs> <laughs> Tidy up a bit. <laughs> Bert and David are returning to Wordsley, Staffordshire, where Bert Spencer and Carl Bridgewater used to live as neighbours just five doors apart. Somewhere here, Carl lived. One of these houses. And uh, we lived in that one there. Which one? That one there, look. And yeah. Carl lived? Somewhere there. So one, two, three, four, five doors away is Carl Bridgewater. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I kind of imagined. See, this is why I'm so interested to be here. I kind of imagined it was going to be really big. No, this was it. It's very intimate. Yeah, this was a kid's playground. All the kids play with each other? Yeah, yeah. But you have no memory of Carl then? No. When I've seen Carl's picture in the paper, I thought, yeah, they all look like that. They all. I hope no one's offended the way I talk. I'm not offending anyone. It was just a kid playing with other kids. It meant nothing to me. That's said in the nicest possible way. I didn't know him. I've seen him perhaps hundreds of times dodging up and down with his, his mates. It's lovely to come back. It's, it's, it's lovely to come back. <laughs> but doesn't this have really... You're flabbergasted. I'm flabbergasted. Why? Well, I kind of thought this would be really emotional. No, it isn't. It's lovely to come back and see how nice this place has been made. Driving away, Bert suddenly spots another house he recognises. He asks to make an unscheduled stop. Bob lived up here. Oh, we've got a camera. Hello, camera. Barbara was Bert's former secretary at the ambulance station 40 years ago. And she's the woman who gave him a cast iron alibi on the day Carl was murdered. She has never spoken on camera before. Does Barbara live here? Are you Julie? I'm Bert. I'm Bert. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> Come here, you cheeky bugger. <laughs> Oh my God! You're all these years, eh? You're looking yeah. lovely. Is she in? Is she all right? Yeah. Barbara. <laughs> hey, babe. Oh, look oh, at you. I'm gonna cry. Let's cry together. <laughs> oh, come here. Oh, we're not going through all of this again, are we? No, no. It's better this time, lovey. Better this time. I wrote a book, Barbara. Yeah to show why a lot of people were wrong in the allegations. I'm bloody crying, hang on a bit. And um, oh, come on. because of we the book... Just <laughs> <laughs> come here, you. <laughs> What's it like seeing him again? I can't believe it. That's a long, long time. And you still look lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Barbara, Barbara, answer me this question. And I, I want Bert not to interrupt. Get on with it. And the one bit from your witness statements that I wonder if we can clarify is that you didn't know if perhaps Bert had gone for lunch on the day that Carl Bridgewater uh, had been murdered. You didn't know he could have gone for lunch, you said, and he normally takes his lunch between 12.30, could go on perhaps as late as 2. Can you remember if Bert took lunch that day that Carl Bridgewater was murdered? What? I suppose so. What? what Going back a few years now, how can I remember what exactly I said with time? But this is it. I always used to go at one o'clock to a half one. But he had various yeah. times. Well, he'd be missing. He'd got lots of hospitals to cope with. He didn't just cope with the COVID. So he could have gone for lunch on that day between oh, those he times? Could have gone. Yes. Yes. Well, that's great, and I just wanted to clarify that's that, fine. and that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So, did you go for, I went for the lunch journey on that with... day? I don't know, for Christ's sake. You don't know. You ha it, this is this is part. This is I the story. Yeah, this cat. This you've been the scapegoat okay. for murder, okay. and you can't remember David. if you went home for lunch. Now on you that listen day. to me. No, I didn't. didn't have a set pattern. I didn't have a set pattern, David. I was all over the bloody place, yeah. and and my phone's never stopped. 
and I was up to So the if you had no set pattern, Bert, you could have been there at four o'clock. You could have been there at five o'clock. By ruling, by opening up further possibilities, you make it more complicated and more possible right, rather than less complicated. Let's close those possibilities that you're making in your mind. You I'm didn't... not making them in my mind. Will you listen? I... I didn't, sure. I didn't go home for lunch. You'll have to believe me. You can't disprove it. I don't want us to argue any further. We're not arguing. We're seriously discussing something that touches my emotions. I've clarified that. Good. I'm delighted to have met you, Barbara. Oh. See ya. <sighs> Bert insists that others saw him at the ambulance station on the day of Carl's murder. But his so-called cast-iron alibi from his secretary, Barbara, is not as cast-iron as he's always claimed. He called at this farm sometime after four o'clock to deliver the evening paper. I'm satisfied from the inquiries we've made that uh, he disturbed or came across intruders to the house, that he was either invited into the house or taken into the house, and there, shot in the head at point-blank range, quite cold-bloodedly, and I can honestly think of no motive other than it had disturbed uh, intruders. We've got to go right here, then. And it should be on the right. Bert is revisiting Yew Tree Farm for the first time in almost four decades. As a young man, he worked and shot on the surrounding farmland, and he himself admits having been inside the house on at least three occasions. Oh, gosh, this is it. Oh, my God. Let's have a look at this. Crikey. I was up and down here hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. You knew the farm well. Oh, crikey, yes. And had you been inside the farmhouse? Yes, house? I had. I had. I'd been in and spoke to them and sat down with them, a cup of tea with them. I knew people came, I knew the doctor came, I knew someone delivered papers, but not who. What does it feel like to be standing outside the place well, that's, you know, your name is attached I know, to the I story know. of the farm that once stood here? I know. Um, if Carl was alive, what is it you would like to say to him? Well, Carl, 35 years ago, because of two horrific murder cases that happened in this vicinity, your name and mine became intrinsically joined. How I wish we could have been fused together under different and happier circumstances. Through the, through the power of silent prayer, I have spoken to and prayed for you, Carl, many times. That's Carl, is what I say to you. God bless you. Uh, and what do you think Carl might say back I to you? I don't know. I really don't. What do you think he might say? He might say you killed him. He might. But he would know that that would be a lie. He wouldn't say that. He was apparently a nice little boy, scout. He wouldn't lie. Why do you think he got murdered that day? Well, I can only go on what the police said. It was a robbery, robbery and he got disturbed. There was a robbery in progress. Robbers don't normally shoot 13-year-old no, boys. No, no. Neither do ambulance men. Thank you very much. Point taken. Ambulance men don't normally shoot their best no. friends. And ambulance men, David, don't go on armed robberies in full dress uniform to places where they are very well known. For me, he was shot because he could identify his killer. I know what you're thinking, but let me just make this perfectly clear. I would not have, under any circumstances, come on an armed robbery to a farm I thought people were in and where I was known and I knew someone delivered papers now. Maybe you weren't doing an armed robbery. You could have been doing anything. You have spotted something when you were in the house. You could have been taking things to sell on. And Carl Bridgewater, because the back door was open, was used to walking in if the back door was open because he would deliver, hand deliver the papers to the elderly couple. That's what's in the police statement. So if he sees the back door open, he walks in and he then encounters somebody and he goes, oh, hello, Mr. Spencer. Yeah. That's the theory of yours, is it? No, it's actually a theory that's in a it's lot a of the- It's a police theory. Do you it's... believe the police? The lies I've told about me and you still believe them? I think 
that he was shot, Carl was shot, because he could identify the, the person or people yes. who were um, breaking in. Well, that's feasible. Is that feasible? It's feasible, I haven't argued against that. But who were he or they or them? Mm -hmm. It certainly wasn't me. Mm -hmm. The four who were arrested for it, I believed, had done it. I don't know, I believed they did. And do you still believe they did? Yes, I do. While Bert says he still believes the Bridgewater Four were responsible for Carl's murder, there is at least one other theory Professor Wilson has uncovered during his recent investigations. A theory that the police never tested at the time. One other vehicle, a green Land Rover, was spotted in the driveway of Yew Tree Farm on the day Carl Bridgewater was murdered and it is probable that that vehicle belonged to none other than Hubert Wilkes. So had Wilkes seen something that incriminated Bert Spencer that day, or was he possibly involved in the burglary himself? Here is the photo fit of one of the men that was seen that day, yeah? And above is... Hubert Wilkes. Well, it should be more squinty, a bit more jowly. It is, doesn't look like him. You don't think that looks no, like him? No, he had no hair like that. And he got squinty eyes. He was jowly, you know what I mean by that? But that, that, that looks uncanny. You don't think he could have been at Yew Tree Farm that day? I never thought of that. Is that a possibility? Uh, yes. Bert's wife, Janet, challenges his version of the events leading up to the murder of Wilkes, especially the sexual advances and special cocktails. But Janet did tell a local reporter at the time that there had been conversations about Carl that night. We can confirm that Mrs Spencer told our reporter, Mr Tony Bishop, that there had been talk about the Carl Bridgewater case at Holloway House Farm on the evening that Mr Wilkes was shot. David Wilson and Bert Spencer will now meet for one last time. David will confront Bert with his theory and present the results of his psychological assessment. This broadcast, this film, will be rather like an Agatha Christie, David. It twists and turns. Halfway through it, you still don't know if the butler did it. If I found evidence that clearly proves that what you've told me was rubbish. Right, bring it. OK. Bring it. OK. How would you like him to be remembered? Oh, as a cheerful boy, always going around nice and cheerful and helpful. Um, you never saw him miserable, you know, he was always smiling and happy. You'll be tormenting somebody else tomorrow. <laughs> Come Are all your people as, as blunt as me? <laughs> Professor David Wilson has spent the last six months looking into the murder of newspaper boy Carl Bridgewater and interviewing one-time suspect Bert Spencer, who has consistently denied any involvement in the boy's death. You all right? You comfortable? Yes. I think the phrase that you used that I always remember was that you said to me that you wouldn't run and you wouldn't hide. I never do. Your alibi is that you were at Corbett Hospital all day on the day that Carl yeah. Bridgewater was murdered. There was another person at Corbett Hospital that day who, of course, was Barbara Reibold. What about the others? Well, but Barbara Reibold in particular was she really important. She made a written statement, I believe. She made several Others, written statements. Well, OK, I didn't know that. Others who worked in the same floor space made verbal, yes, OK, he was here, but they didn't write it down. They didn't have to. The coppers at the time didn't do everything right, what I think is right. They didn't ask, will you make a statement? Will you make a statement? They didn't feel the need. Someone's already done it. And Barbara Reibold made those statements. Yes, yeah. And as you know, I've tracked down those statements. And you were there when I asked her, could she say that she was there all afternoon and was able to 
verify that you were there all afternoon. And she can't. She can't guarantee what times you may have right. left Corbett Hospital all afternoon. It means that you don't have a cast iron alibi. Okay. That, that alibi is, well, it disappears, but... I accept what you say. I don't have now a cast iron alibi. Do you have any evidence that I killed Carl Bridgewater? If you do, sir, bring it forward. If you don't, shut your mouth. OK, you've now annoyed me. You've, you get annoyed by me fairly regularly, I do, yes. but, and you threaten me quite a lot as That's well. That's not threatening, it's but me talking straight. I also asked you, Bert, in relation to the Wilkes connection, what was happening the night that you took Hubert Wilkes' life? Your wife at the time made statements to various places saying that Carl Bridgewater was mentioned that night. Well, if it was, I wasn't in the room at that time. I didn't mention it. She says it was mentioned I at the time. I don't care what she says. I'm not rubbishing her statement. I'm saying to you, I wasn't in the room when it was, if it was. You can't just say what she says it was. That's what I'm saying to you. That's my response. Hubert Wilkes was goading you. I wonder if that plays a part in relation to what happened at you. Have you Farm. spoken with Jean Wilkes, who sat in the lounge that night? No, I haven't. Why? Well, because I can't find Jean Wilkes. Well, there was no discussion of the Carl Bidwater case. If there had have been, David, so what? Did you and Hubert Wilkes ever discuss uh, robberies? We never did. Right. OK. Now, I'm going to play you something, but at the moment, I particularly wanted you to hear what your daughter said in relation to Hubert Wilkes and the discussion of robberies. I particularly remember he would stand at the fire with his back to the fire and I was lying on the settee. He would just constantly talk about robberies mm. and how you can commit the perfect crime by escaping through the woods. And I'd I'm like sorry, to think, I, I, I don't agree with that. Hubert Wilkes used to come to my house and drink whiskey. Never discussed robberies with me. So your daughter's wrong? She's made a mistake. Well, she doesn't think that, but... OK, a lot of people think I killed Carl Bridgewater. I know I didn't, but I can't change their opinion. This is really where I'm coming to. Would you mind if I showed you something? Show me. They, these are a distressing... What do you mean if I would I mind? Show me. These I'm are distressing photographs. Show me. These are, the, these are the crime scene photographs of Carl Bridgewater. Right. That's at the scene, I assume. Yeah. Yes. OK. That's, Why have you showed that, that? I've showed you that because I think with the fact that you no longer have an alibi, that something happened that day that involved you at Yew Tree Farm, and I want you to listen again. I've always felt that he saw something that day that killed him inside. If a story ever came out like I'd finished my shift and I'd got a little bit of time and I thought, all right, I'll go and do that errand. And then suddenly you hear a gunshot go off. And then after it's all dispersed and you see something. Tell me, I can't hear it. I can hear something. At and what you're witnessing and what you're seeing and you're just horrified. I have tried to discuss that with him on, on, on an occasion, but he was very emotional. Was that what happened? No. Did you go to Yew Tree Farm that day? Your daughter thinks that you did go to Yew yes, Tree I've Farm. I just heard what you said. She also thinks it was after my shift, after 5pm, too late. Too late, mate. Even if I got there at quarter past, 20 past, there's no gunshot. That was an hour ago. Did you go after No, I shift? did not. You, you've forgotten the time, she said. Did after you go after your shift? No, for Christ's sake. What for? What? I wasn't working there that month. What for? Well, after our first interview, I did a P scan on you. What's that? It means psychopathy scan. So this isn't a clinical diagnosis. This is a way that I can gain some insight into the person that I'm talking to. And the total score for you was in the high range. 
A total score that falls in the high range should be a cause for serious concern. It suggests that the person of interest may have many or most of the features that define psychopathy. Such a person is likely to be egocentric, callous, cold-blooded, predatory, impulsive, irresponsible, dominant, deceptive, manipulative, and lacking in empathy, guilt, or genuine remorse for socially deviant and criminal acts. And that fits you to a T. It also fits you, you bugger. Some of the things you've said, to a T. This is you, Bert. So you you've, are... just con you've just condemned me then, haven't you? You are somebody that I regard... As a psychopath. As a liar. Yeah. As somebody who has bent the truth as somebody who's manipulative, yeah. as conning. You're not this kindly old grandfather figure. That's your shtick, Bert, and I see through it. And all I can say to you is, in the absence of you having any alibi, because you were there when Barbara Ribel says she cannot stand up where you were on the afternoon that Carl Bridgewater was I'm murdered. I'm not going to say, let me get a word in. I am going to get a word in, David. I think you need to see a psychiatrist. You are wrong. So very wrong. You're egoistic, all Mr Important. What the hell does it matter what you think? The evidence shows. How the hell can I be there when I wasn't there? You'll have to prove that. Go ahead, do what you want. But I think you need psychiatric treatment, son. There's something wrong with the way you think. That is my belief. I think now it's really a question for other people to make their decision on these kinds of things. Because well, all I it. can do is tell you what I felt and I will raise this elsewhere. OK, do that. Thank you. Big silence in the room. It's a fucking nutcase. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. He knows that if he starts admitting that he was at Yew Tree Farm, then actually, then the police have got to be re-interviewing him. It's all a load of absolute nonsense. It really is. I, I could not believe what I was hearing. He can't work it out, so instead of failing, he wants me as a scapegoat. I'll certainly stand by my man. Every inch of the way. This psychopath needs a cuddle. Right. Well, as ever in the world of Bert Spencer, just when you think you've got some kind of conclusion, another opening offers itself as a possibility. Somebody's made contact with us that I've been wanting to speak to throughout this entire process. Bert's first wife. Janet has never spoken before on camera and has maintained a silence for some 38 years. I don't know what she's going to say, but I know whatever she says is going to be absolutely fascinating. Bert and Janet married as teenagers and lived in Wordsley for their entire marriage. This is the first time Janet has ever spoken publicly about her husband. Why do you want to talk about it now? After You've never spoken publicly to the press before. Why now? Why 38 years later? Because... I just think it's about time. As I tell my side of the story. Janet, how long were you married to Barrett Spencer for? Uh, about 16, 17 years. What was it that first uh, attracted you to him? I don't know, his personality. He came across, you know, as a very nice person. On the day that Carl Bridgewater was murdered, did Bert seem his normal self? I came into the house, um, walked through, straight through to the kitchen. We'd 
we'd had a kitchen extension and it overlooked the garden, nice big window. And I saw Bert standing there uh, with his hands in his pockets, body language telling me that he wasn't very happy. Um, and I also noticed a jumper that had been pegged on the line, which which a man had put on because women don't peg jumpers on like that. I went down, saw him, asked him, you know, everything OK? He said he didn't feel very well. Was that one of Bert's work jumpers? What colour was it? No, it was, it was a, a casual jumper, a green, a green jumper. Um, did you ever see that jumper again? No, never. But it was it was it clear to you that Bert had washed the jumper? Oh yeah. It just disappeared. It just disappeared. Mm -hmm. The night that Carl was murdered, you went out to celebrate a family member's birthday. Correct. Yeah. What happened when you and Bert came home from that celebration? Uh, we came home fairly early, before ten o'clock, and. Uh, he went to bed, I put a television on and, and I was listening to news at 10, I think it was at that time. And of course the headlines were all to do with the murder of Carl. Um, and as I, I listened to it all, the fact that he'd lived very close to where we used to live, who he was, the farm, and, and, and I know Bert had gone up the farm shooting and he knew the area well and I was, I was just horrified with all the connections, really, to us and to Bert. So I, I went upstairs uh, into the bedroom. I shook his arm, he, he wasn't asleep. Um, and I just said to him, please, God, please tell me that you had nothing to do with that murder, you know. And his reply was, no, I didn't, but don't you think they'll be after me? It's on my patch. That was his reply. Janet, in September 1978, did Bert own a shotgun? Yes, he did. What happened to that shotgun? Um, I remember him saying, probably the day after Carl Bridgewater, that Carl Bridgewater murder, that um, he ought to, you know, get rid of it or take it somewhere. Uh, and I don't know what happened to it, but he... There was a gun in the house at the time. And he did have a shotgun licence for it. And he disposed of the shotgun mm. the day after Carl Bridgewater That's was right, murdered? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you question him about why he wanted to do that? No. I'm afraid not. I didn't. I mean, it was my husband. I just couldn't believe that... You know, he'd be anyway remotely involved in something like that. I, I should have done, I suppose, but, you know, as you said yourself, he's, he's a very plausible man. I just wanted to believe that he'd got nothing to do with it. So I didn't ask what he'd done with this. Were, was Barrett worried? Yeah, he... The next day, um, I think, I don't know whether the police saw him the next day, but certainly they'd had a few calls about him. Yet he was, he was uh, concerned, and I, I said, well, I don't know why you would, because you were at work. And what did he say to that? He said, well, I... I I wasn't there all day. He said he wasn't at work all day? Mm. He said I wasn't there all the time because... I said, why? And he said, because I didn't feel well. 
So he says I was in the toilets for a long time. I told me problem. I said, well, surely someone must have seen you. Somebody must have heard you or seen you go into the toilets. I said, no. Bert clearly collected antiques, bought and sold antiques. Were you ever worried that some of those antiques were stolen? No, I, I, I never suspected that, although he did a lot of wheel, wheel of dealing. But there was a time in between, before Mr Wilkes was shot, Something was found in in one of our friends' sheds. A bag a, a containing antiques had been found in their shed because someone had seen Bert coming out of their driveway. And so the husband went down to have a look in the shed and, and found this bag of antiques, brassware and copper, and, and, and tackled Bert about it. Uh, Bert had been asked to move it. And I did question him about this bag. And his words to me were, you must never, ever tell anybody about that. Ever. So I said, well, uh, OK, but, you know, what happened to them? He said he'd buried them somewhere around the Prestwood area, which is off the I-449. When you put all the various pieces of information that you're in possession of together now, what does it lead you to conclude? Well, man, there's, there's no concrete ev evidence, but I, f I really believe that if he didn't even if he didn't actually shoot, he he knows more about that than he's let on. Would it surprise you if the truth was, Bert Spencer, your ex-husband, killed Carl Bridgewater? Would that surprise you? No, it wouldn't. In fact, do you suspect that's what happened? Well, you know, it's hard to say, but deep down, yes, I probably... I do, really, now. It's, it's something I've had to live with for a long time by not saying anything or... might, might amount to nothing, what my memories are, but... Would you like the police to reopen this case? Well, I can say so that's the only course of action now. I think he's, you know, because he's written a book and we've got a documentary coming that, you know, he's, he's forced uh, uh, my hand, really. I've never, ever spoken before. regardless of all of the allegations that keep coming my way. Hear this. I will never, ever be a scapegoat for the murder of Carl Bridgewater, for you or any other idiot who comes forward with allegedly accusations. I feel sure there will be more in the future. I will cope with them. <laughs>